right now we want to get to an interview that Donnie and I were able to conduct uh, middle of last week. Um, had a great time talking with a uh, really great trainer, John Iceman Scully. I got to talk about uh, what he's up to, um, the difference between the amateur and the pro game, and just uh, some fighters that are getting ready to fight and some things that are wrong in the sport. So I hope you enjoy this interview with the Iceman. Boxing Asylum fans, here we are with another interview. Today we have the pleasure to interview 49 Fight professional veteran and top-tier trainer, John the Iceman Scully. Uh, John, how are you doing today, and uh, what, what have you been up to the, the last few months? Um, everything's great. Uh, just actually this week, uh, last week, I moved to Florida, Orlando, Florida. And um, so I'm, I'm trying to get situated down here, actually, at the moment. Um I'm going around checking out certain gyms, and uh, it looks like I'm going to start training a, a couple fighters down here. So uh, basically, I'm just trying to get myself uh, uh, dug into the landscape down here. And uh, what inspired your move uh, to to head down to Florida? Uh, well, one day, the wife told me we were moving, and I said, <laughs> okay, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's that's pretty much you're you're a much smarter man than some uh, some of us are, my friend. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this: What was it that made you know, once your fighting career was over, that you could make a successful transition into the role of a trainer? Um. Well, I'll tell you two things. To be honest, to be honest with you, and it's kind of uh, kind of crazy, but when I started boxing officially, I started boxing when I was twelve, but officially in the gym, I started when I was fourteen. And I literally felt from the first day in the gym, if you would have asked me, what are you going to be doing in 30 years? I would have said, oh, I'll be boxing. I'll be in the game. I'll be doing something. I just knew right from the start that that was going to be the rest of my life. There was no question. And uh, as far as training boxers, a lot of people may not realize this, but I've been actually training amateur boxers uh, since 1992 when my career was only three and a half years old. Um, I was training amateurs. I was going to national tournaments. And, I mean, when I fought Michael Nunn in December of uh, 1995, literally about two and a half weeks later, I was sleeping on the floor in a, in a motel room uh, at an amateur tournament in upstate New York. And I remember I was one of the other coaches there. He was he was on the floor. And I remember uh, it was like 3 in the morning. We couldn't sleep. And, and I remember just uh, through the darkness, and I was like, Ryan, I said, three weeks ago, I was in a suite at Foxwoods on ESPN fighting Michael Nunn um, hmm. on the floor of this motel <laughs> waiting for these amateur fights tomorrow. And uh, so, you know, I've always been a trainer. That's just always been, been part of my game. So uh, it was just natural. It was just a, a foregone conclusion that I would just switch over. Let me ask you this. Is, since you're someone that's trained amateurs and professionals, what what changes – what dramatic impacts do you think it's going to have with them moving towards the 10 point system and no headgear in the next olympics uh, I, I don't even i don't even follow amateur boxing anymore other than on a local level when my guys box but as far as i don't even i haven't watched the olympics in eight years um i'm just i'm not even interested i just they're ruining the game they're ruining it i mean the, the no headgear and the, the pro style and it's just uh it's terrible terrible there you know when we were kids you know you had the Sugar Ray Leonard's and the the Roy Jones and you know it was just uh it was patriotic and it was exciting and it was you know now since you know it started when they started putting the uh the NBA players in the in the uh Olympics you know and then they're they're cheering USA USA when we're like dominating some third world country with the, you know we've got Shaq and Jordan and they've got some guy that's like five two you know and and we're dominating these guys uh they're just ru you know all the way around they're just ruining the olympic games for, for me and a lot of other people so uh you know i mean i'm i'm, I'm against it a thousand percent uh, you know i couldn't be more against the scoring system and the the whole you know aiba has gotten into actually signing professional fighters now um which i you know i never thought would happen but uh so the, the times that we live in, it's not it's not the Olympic spirit anymore, that's for sure. And let me ask, do you think as these kids are coming up um, through the amateur program now, if they're not going to be wearing headgear, 
Do you think the ones that move into the pro ranks following that are going to be facing shorter careers because they will endure more damage over their younger years? Oh, sure. And not just that, but the, the, the headgear, you know, the reason, the main reason we wear headgear in the gym, um, you know, it's not necessarily to, to limit the punishment, but it's to prevent from headbutts because headbutts just are, are brutal. I mean, I mean, the, you know, you're almost guaranteed to get a cut or you're certainly going to get damaged. So a lot of amateur fights now, which never happened before in history, are going to be stopped due to cuts. Um, so guys are going to come into the pros, and they're already going to have scar tissue. They're already going to have problems uh, from day one. Well, I mean, Matty, I'm sorry, just to be clear here, isn't the no headgear thing only going to be an international competition? Like, isn't domestic amateur uh, fights still going to no, be? No, 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 the nationals. They, listen, this is how stupid it is. I mean, I mean, you have to really pay attention so you can keep up with what I'm saying. The nationals, when you go to the, there's only, there's a lot of nationals. You hear amateurs say, oh, the nine-time national amateur champion. You know, you weren't. Like, like I could say I was a three-time national champion because I won three <laughs> national tournaments. But the only ones that count is the Golden Gloves and the U.S. Championships. That's the Nationals. And technically, under uh, USA Boxing rules, the, the U.S. Championships, it's the only National. Like when you hear a guy in the old days say, I was a, that guy's a two-time National Champion, that means he won the U.S. Championships twice. Right. Now, well, everyone knows. Like I remember in 1987, I went to the Olympic Training Center. I was part of the USA team. And... I remember calling my, my friend back home. He was a big boxing fan. And I was like, man, Andrew Maynard's my roommate. You know, he's he's U.S. champ. You know, he's the champ. And, uh, you know, it was a big deal. Now, they, they literally, this year, they crowned three U.S. national champions in each weight class. They crowned a junior like champion. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's just like the pros. They have a... A junior champion, which is 17, I guess, to 19 years old, they have a no headgear champion and a headgear champion. So you could choose before the tournament if you want to wear headgear or not. So if you want to wear headgear, you fight the guys that wear headgears. If you don't, you fight the guys that don't wear the headgear. So there's three national champions because there was a kid in New Haven that won. And I'm like, man, I was telling his coach, like, your kid won the national championship? He goes, yeah. And then I hear the kid from Holyoke won it. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. They said the kid from New Haven won it. And they go, no, no, no. The kid from New Haven was only 17. He won the juniors. The kid <laughs> from Holyoke won the uh, the, head, the non-headgear championship. So then there's another kid somewhere in the country who's the headgear champion. It's uh, it's beyond ridiculous. Like it's just stupid. Just... So now there's three guys saying they're national champions. So do you think this is actually what they're doing is going to almost separate the styles of fighters where you got the kids that are that are punchers wanting to go in with the no headgear and then you'll have the people that are more of the uh, straight boxing types will want to be in the headgear division? Probably, and then there's guys that just, uh, they're thinking about turning pro, so they want to wear the no headgear. Uh, but ultimately, it's Aiba. Aiba has taken to signing pros. They're signing up. Amateurs, they, they've turned it into a, a literally a farm system for their pro careers. Um, so it's uh, you know it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's it's all political. It's 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 gone that way. And j- just to switch gears here, um, a, a man that you trained that is a very polarizing in boxing circles is Chad Dawson. And what do you attribute? to what seems to be him just kind of falling off over the few years, the last few years. Um, the, all the things that had once excited people about Chad, um, the, they seem to not be as apparent anymore. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of aspects to it. I'll tell you, one, one is the fact that the game has changed so much with guys they make so much money in the fight. They have to wait for the TV dates. You know, you never see a, you never see Shane Mosley in a ten rounder off off TV. You know, it's always some kind of title fight. It's got to be on TV. It's got to be on a major network. So he can only fight once or twice a year now. Um, so Chad had to wait for dates. So as a result, over the last few years, he, uh, you know, he's probably regressed a little bit just because he's not fighting. He's only fighting, you know, once or twice a year. I, re- I remember when I was first pro, you know, a couple years into it, and I remember 
I, you know, I didn't feel the same after a while. I felt like I wasn't as sharp as I was as an amateur. And I was down in Pensacola, Florida, and I was talking to Roy Jones' father about it. And he, and he said something very, very interesting. He said, you know what it is? And he right away, you know, he, he felt he knew what it was. He said, when you were an amateur, you were fighting the best fighters in the country and the world constantly. And, uh, you know, you go to one tournament, and then you fight five fights or three fights or whatever it is in that tournament, and three weeks later you're at another tournament, and you're, you're fighting, uh, you know, top-ranked guys. So, like, in a span of six months in 1988, for example, as an amateur, I fought about seven guys that were either ranked in the top ten in the country, they were former national champions, they were world-ranked fighters, so I was at a high level constantly, and you're sharp. As a pro you get regressed because you're not, you're not competing. A lot of these guys, you got to understand, a lot of people think fighters are in the gym every day of the year, and, and they're not. I know guys like Chad included. They don't go to the gym unless a fight is set. Like right now, um, Chad's not in the gym. He probably hasn't been in the gym. I'm sure he hasn't been in the gym since his last fight. Uh, so people regress. They, they, they live off their past. And, um, you know, they used to be when the, when the Ray Robinsons and those guys were around. Boxing was their job, so they were in the gym every week of the year. They they hardly took any rest. So um, fighters are regressing more, uh, I think, as that that goes on. And the other thing is, you know, you get a guy like Chad. I mean, you can fight Bernard Hopkins and make make a ton of money. You know, there's there's not that much motivation for certain guys to get back in the gym and go make more money because they already have money. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let me ask you this, John, because um, because you're touching on something interesting there. Do you think? I mean, given um, where they're at now compared to where they were a few years ago, you know, Floyd Mayweather is a guy that seems to keep himself constantly in shape. He takes care of himself. He's in the gym. Right. Whereas Manny Pacquiao is going off of that path. You know, he's got his political career and a lot of other. You know, he's just he's got his his hands in a lot of other things. Do you think that it's that simple dedication that is what now separates them, obviously, compared to a few years ago when so many people could not discern which fighter they thought would win in a match between the two? Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, as time goes on, it's like, I'll give you an example, like an analogy compared to what you're saying. If you watch a fight, any pro fight, 12-round fight, and you see two guys in the first round, I never go by the first round. Like a, a guy could win the first round big, and everybody's like, "Oh man, it's a done. It's over. It's over. He got him." I'm like, "Listen, it's only the first round. Like you have to see what happens as time goes on. The sixth round is going to be a lot different than the first round. The people are going to be in a different state physically and mentally. That's what happened over the long term with a guy like Floyd Mayweather and a guy like Manny Pacquiao. Floyd Mayweather and, and Bernard Hopkins are the two guys that come to mind that I know in the modern era that treated like the Sugar Ray Robinsons did. They, they're in the gym all the time. They will always be in shape. They will always be sharp. Uh, Mayweather, uh, you know, he's notorious for that. Hopkins made his career off of that. So, um, you know, the, probably uh, two of the greatest role models that we have are those two guys, And um, but the coaches need to point it out to people. They need to tell their fighters, like, look at these two guys. Look how sharp they are at their age. And then you look at other guys, who regressed in their 20s because they missed months and months and months out of the year of training and of sharpening them up, up and practicing certain things. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, boxing has regressed just because the fighters in this year don't have the same mentality that, that the ones that were really hungry did back in the old days. Now, uh, let me just ask, I mean, uh, have you, given, given Chad Dawson's proclivity for changing trainers, have you uh, received any contact from him uh, about possibly reuniting? <laughs> no. And I think he knows, like, and, 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 and I can be completely honest with you. If they told me, look, you train this guy again, it'll be the same, you know, you'll make good money, blah, 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 you I would not do it. It's just, it was, you know, I spent that last training camp literally every day from halfway through the camp on just saying to myself, I, I just can't wait till this is over. Like I'm like even if he win, even if he beat Andre Ward, uh, I was not gonna train him again. I and I would have been the first train everyone would have said, What are you crazy? Your guy just became pound for pound the man. How could you not yeah. train him? And it's just not worth it to me. I mean if I didn't have my daughter and my wife back home, uh, you know, it'd be different. 
but you know when I'm when I'm there dealing with the the you know a changed person and 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 they're back home, you know I said, man, I'd rather be home with them and not make the money than be out here and be miserable because I mean the fact is, and it's nothing against Chad. I mean a, a lot of fighters, he's not he's far from the only one, but people change. They get older. They have their priorities change. Uh, you know he he had a lot of success, and I think it affected him a little bit. And it, and it changed them, and it, and it and it and it carried over into our relationship. You know, it wasn't the same as when he was younger and when he before he beat Hopkins. So fighters fighters change. You're not you're not you're literally not the same person you were five years ago. And John, but let me ask you this, John. Uh, I'm curious as to you know you as as you know keeping your eye on fighters, watching fights, and and picking out little things. Who are some fighters that you would really love to get your hands on and train them because you see so much more potential in them than what they're putting forth in the ring? Um, you know what? I've, I've never really thought about that, to be honest with you. Because, um, uh, you know, in our game, it's like a taboo to even go there. I mean, you know, and it's, and it's not even so much now, but years ago it was different. Uh, uh, I'll, give, I'll give an example. Uh, as Like when I was with Chad, for the last camp, and I won't name names, but there was people there who weren't there in camp with us before, and they're, you know, they're putting their input in, into the, you know, tell, talking to chat right in front of me, putting their input in. And I'm saying to myself, like, you, don't you guys know the, the rules? Don't you know the rules? Like, you don't talk to another man's fighter. You don't, you know, you don't interrupt. Whatever, you know, even if you think he's not training right, you, you don't interrupt. The trainer has his way, and you may not realize what it is yet, you know, you have to wait to the fight to see how it turns out. Um, so well, there's a lot of good fighters out there, but uh, I never really thought about it just because, uh, you know, it's like um, they they already have trainers, so I never never I, I never really thought of it. The, the way you put it, I actually never never thought about it. Uh, but there's a lot of good guys. I mean, one thing about me, I mean, I would train just about anybody. I mean, I mean, a lot of a lot of trainers they would only take on top guys, you know, and, and, and I'm not knocking them or anything. It's just they're in a position where they only want to take top guys to start training. But I'm the type, I mean, if I have a kid and he's two and five and he asks me, would I train him? I, I would train him. I mean, I'm just, I'm just in it to help the fighters and whether it's Chad Dawson or it's just uh, Joe from Missouri. And, and John, I have a, a little list here of some fighters that that create heated arguments between boxing fans as to as to what their potential is, and I'm just curious about your opinion on these fighters, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first guy I'd like to ask you about is Keith Thurman. Well, I'll tell you this much. I uh, you know I know he was a decorated amateur. I've heard good things about him. I've heard you know I've heard you always hear whenever you hear a kid like that, you always hear somebody go, "Oh, he's not that good. He's not that much." And I've heard other people say, oh, he's going to be the next Floyd Mayweather. He's going to be the next superstar. Uh, I can only say this. I know a guy who lives down where he lives in the St. Petersburg area. And he told me a few months ago, I said, oh, what do you think of that kid? He goes, he goes, that kid, even when he was 15, at least once a week, he was knocking somebody out in the gym. Pros, he would knock out pros, grown men. Anybody he said he said people who did not enjoy sparring with him when he was fifteen, sixteen years old. He was just knocking out people. That, that you know, sounds really similar guys. to Mike Tyson, doesn't it? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. But the yeah. thing is, I think Keith is, you know, he's he's not necessarily like a he's not a face first brawler. I mean, he has some some boxing talents, but yeah. uh, but that was that's the word on him uh, that that in the gyms he was notorious for just wreaking havoc. Um, so, uh, you know, that coupled with his amateur career and, you know, how he's looking as a pro, I mean, he's, uh, he certainly could be a star. I mean, but by the same token, by the same token, uh, anything could happen. You know, he could go out his next fight, get hit with one shot from some guy we never even heard of, and he could go to sleep for five minutes. Ironically, um, he's going in I, with a puncher that no one has really ever heard of next. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, well, there you go. I mean, I mean, it, it, it happens. It certainly happens. You, you never know. Um, but uh, as far as potential, I mean, I mean, uh, he's shown it in his fights and in his amateur career. But uh, but that always stuck with me. My my friend telling me that this guy's, you know, brutalized some people in the gym on a regular basis. Yeah, and I, I've heard um, from a couple sources that Dan Birmingham considers Keith his finest work to this point. So I I, I always 
really took a mental note of that and what it means. Um, right, right. But uh, here's here's a guy that I I can't stand him on a personal level, and I'm afraid it might cloud my judgment <laughs> on him as a fighter. And and that's Adrian Broner. Yeah, you know what? I tell you a couple things. You will never, you would never. Sugar Ray Robinson, Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, Marvin Hagler. They would never have a YouTube video out of them <laughs> going to the bathroom and the Dunkin' Donuts. Okay? Yeah. I mean, I mean, really, like, that is a, it is unbelievable how stupid this kid is. Like, it's, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not afraid to say it. This kid is stupid. He's, he's ignorant. And, and the reflection he puts on the word champion is a disgrace. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I just think he's, he's young. And some people are 22 and they're, tw- and they're 30. But some people are 22 and they're 12. Yeah. And he's 12. You know what I mean? Uh, I think he's very talented, but I think Paulie Malignaggi and, and a few other guys, but Paulie sealed it for me that he's not what they say he He's not the superstar, the heir apparent. I think he's very good. Um, you know, he, he's, he's very talented, et cetera, et cetera. But he's not. Paulie showed a lot of weaknesses in this guy and a lot of things that are just missing in him. And and, and and like I say, I mean, part of it is is uh just his 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 ways outside the ring. You know, they reflect and uh you know the way they brought him up and like I say that 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 YouTube video for me was the last straw. That's just I mean I mean that's just a disgrace to the word champion. Yeah, I have trouble maintaining my professionalism when discussing the guy because he, he does a lot of the things he does, um they they do sicken me. So I'm I'm glad to hear that it's not just me. Um John let me ask you, this is a guy who has incredible talent, but we're still waiting for him to step up. To me, it seems like he has the fastest hand since Meldrick Taylor. I'm talking about Gary Russell Junior. Right. Um, I mean, I think, you know, they're, they're going to put him in with better guys. And, and my feeling is that when he steps in with better guys, he's going to do even better. You know, some guys, they're, they're young and they're, 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 they've got that superstar potential and they were great amateurs. And, and, you know, they're being brought along a little bit slower than they would even like. And they reach a point where they just kind of get, uh, you know, stagnant. Yeah, he, he's he's probably he's anxious to fight the better names, but you know you don't want to put him in with the absolute elite either. So now it's probably a thing where they're they're caught up and they're not sure which level to go to yet. Um, but I my my feeling is that he's going to step up. I, I I think he's really good. And I can kind of kill two birds with one stone on this question. Um, they're still discussing it for the Mayweather Alvarez pay per view. Um, a match between Danny Garcia and Lucas Matisse. What, what do you see out of those two fighters, and, and who do you think is going to take that match? Um, boy, uh, it's a, you know, my my gut feeling, I guess, would be to uh, to go with Matisse. Um, but Garcia, I mean, I mean, you know, it is part of it, and, and this is kind of another subject uh, in terms of boxing perception, but. You know, you look at him, he seems kind of like a young kid. Like, I look at him, he looks almost like an amateur, facially. You know, he looks like a kid you'd see at a Golden Glove tournament. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, he stepped up with these guys, and they keep putting him in with good fighters. And I kind of say to myself, so God said, oh, you know, maybe that's a little bit more than he can chew right now. And he comes through, and he's winning, you know, clearly. Like, he's he's not having much problem with these guys. And, and even Zab, who's got the fast hands and everything, I mean, he overcame a lot of adversity and a lot of rough spots. So, um, you know, I, I like him. I think he's more than a, just a puncher. He's known for his power, but I think he's, he's more than that. Um, but just right now, I think the way the stars are aligned for each guy, I just feel like if I had to bet $5, I'd bet on Matisse. Yeah, it's just, he's, I mean, there's three punchers in the sport that really are blowing me away right now. Well, actually four. It's Matisse, Golovkin, Stevenson, and Kovalev. Um, right, right, right. Yeah, well, Stevenson, uh, which I've, I've I've said several times recently on, on interviews, um, he's, a, he's a puncher. And I know people that know him personally, and, and one of them was Emmanuel Stewart who trained him. And, and I told a lot of people, where Emmanuel Stewart, I saw the last time I actually really talked to Emmanuel was the night before Chad and Hopkins fought in Atlantic City, and we sat down in the lounge for it was, I mean, it, may, it might have been an hour, I and mean, we we talked for a while about a lot of stuff, 
and he brought up Adonis. And I didn't know that much about Adonis at the time. And he said to me, that's the hardest puncher I've ever worked with. He said, I've never, this was his quote, I've never seen anything like it, not even with Tommy. That's crazy. And, uh, he said in the gym, he said, this guy spars people, and they complain for five or six days after, not not about their jaw or their ribs, traditionally. He said, if he hits them on the elbow, their elbow hurts for five days. If he <laughs> hits them on the shoulder, their shoulder hurts for five days. And and I remember, uh, you know, recently um, Russ Amber, who's a top trainer, underrated trainer, he's, he's in Montreal, he's the owner of uh, Rival Boxing Products, uh, he worked with Adonis. He used to tell me years ago, when I didn't even know who Adonis was, and he's a fellow, you know, I'm working with this kid, this kid is the hardest puncher I've ever worked with. You know, and, he, and, and Russ worked with a lot of, a lot of guys. Um, so, and I know people that have told me that he can't even spar with super middleweights and light heavyweights because they, they, the average guy just can't take his power in the gym every day, day after day. So they put him in with cruiserweights and heavyweights. Um, so he's just, uh, uh, but I, I'll tell you a funny thing. It's kind of a funny story. It'll reflect the opinion that somebody respected has for Adonis. Now, and I don't think that's a necessarily good fighter in terms of his talent and skill, but power negates all of that. And, uh, and Russ Amber was at the fight with Chad and um, Adonis. And for some reason, he, Adon, Russ was in the uh, Chad's dressing room for something. He was checking on the gloves or something. And, and he said he noticed, like, it was a very laid-back atmosphere. They were kind of joking around. And, you know, they were, they were casual, calm. And he pulled one of the guys that he knew aside. And he, said, uh, he said, you know, not for nothing, but uh, do you guys realize who you're going in with? Like, and he used the word nuclear. He said, do you realize this guy is a nuclear puncher that <laughs> what you're about to face? You know, and they were like, oh, we got it. You know, we're just keeping loose. And he was like, all right, you know, I just want to make sure you know, you know, you got to do any P's and Q's with this guy. And, um, you know, I think maybe Chad overlooked him a little bit because he, uh, I mean, the fact is, you and people make this mistake, but you know Chad fought and beat a much higher level of competition. And uh, but but I don't care. I remember Vinny Tazienza years ago. He fought this guy at Bolanos, and Bolanos was like something like twenty-five and zero with twenty-four knockouts. And people were saying he had never fought anybody. And he said, <laughs> and Vinny said, I don't care if he fought his grandmother twenty-five times. She would have got lucky at least one time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so I don't, well, whoever Adonis was knocking out, you know, he was knocking him out. And, uh, you know, I think the world sees now that, 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 uh, he's something to be reckoned with. So is, he's, uh, he, he may not be Superman, uh, talent wise, but he's Superman punching wise. Do you think this is one of the best light heavyweight eras we've seen really probably since the early eighties? You know, I think it's good and it's, it's quiet and it's underrated. Like people don't. The average person on the street doesn't know. You know, where boxing fans in the 70s, they were like, oh, man, Michael, Mike Rossman, Victor Legin, Legin, uh, Galindez, and Matty Shah Muhammad. Like, everybody knew these guys. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of casual boxing fans may not know Adonis and Tavoris Cloud. But if you were to do a, a six-man tournament or an eight-man tournament, you had Dawson, Cleverly, Hopkins, Cloud, I mean, uh, Pascal, Ute, Pascal. I mean, you you you'd have some excitement. You'd have some high interest going right there. And Kovalev, yeah, no, well, that I mean, that's that's one of the problems, right? Those those fights were on CBS and uh, Saturday afternoons. Oh Back right, yeah, the everybody, the whole world knew, knew. I mean, Jerry Martin was famous. <laughs> you know what I mean? James Scott was famous. Everybody knew these guys. Um, yeah. You know, now you've got uh, world champions in the division now. And uh, they could walk into a gym. It's, it's, it's such a crazy thing. I'll bet you, and I don't want to name me, I'm not disrespecting anybody. I'm just talking about the climate of the times. There's world champions, like heavyweight and heavyweight, that could walk into a busy gym. And there's a good chance that most of the people in the gym wouldn't know who they were. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. But I, I was in Kmart in 1987. I was in a Kmart in Windsor, Connecticut. And Gary Hinton walked in. Now, you might not even know who Gary Hinton is, but he was IBF champion. He, uh, he, had, he had fought Aaron Pryor, and he was IBF champion, Gary Hinton. I was the, I'm sure I was the only person within 10 miles that had any idea who he was. And I knew him as soon as I saw him. But, uh, you know, I mean, obviously Muhammad Ali couldn't walk in. Everybody would know. <laughs> but Gary Hinton walked in. Nobody knew who he was. And uh, he's a champion. he was a reigning and defending champion of the world at that moment. 
And John, just to, to to switch gears here, um, just from you as you know, as someone that's been in the game and is also you know has very good historical perspective. Do you think that we're in an era of critically bad judging, or do you think it's just the way the world is connected through media and the internet these days that it's just being exposed more often since we have more access to articles and hearing about fights? You know, um, I guess that makes sense on the overall level, but I think as far as the big fights go, um, I would say, you know, fight for fight is probably a little more prevalent now. And I'm not, I'm not even sure why exactly that is, but, uh, but I will say this, in defense, I mean, if I could try to defend a judge, I'll say this, um, judges are human, and I think, and I've always said this, I think sitting ringside, right on the ring apron, is the absolute worst spot to judge a fight in the entire arena. The judges have the worst seat in the house. People go, oh man, but they're right next to the ring, they see everything. I say, no, they don't. Think about it. If you sit in the front row, I, if I, I don't, I never sit in the front row to fight because it's a terrible seat. I always go back about twelve to fifteen rows. That's the seat. You know, I, ideally, a judge should sit in a soundproof booth, elevated, uh, right there, about fifteen or twenty feet, thirty feet behind the ring, because they're in a bad spot. So what what people see twenty rows back in a corner, you know, two guys are in a corner and, and the guys pounding the guy apparently but the guy's slipping the punches in the corner so half the people think he's losing and the other half see that he's not getting hit i think a lot of the judges in the wrong corner if they're on the wrong side of the ring they can't see it as well if you get a judge on one side and he's looking straight ahead and the corner in the right hand corner uh a guy's in the corner and the other fighter is punching him and he's got his so all the all the judge can see is his back the back of the man that's punching. He cannot see. So you'd have to just assume that the guy in the corner is getting hit more than he is. So, um, you know, I, that's one aspect of it. So I try to defend the judges a little bit. Um, but the fact is, too, uh, there is, and I can't name names, you know, but there's judges that should not be judges. I, I personally could tell you I know people personally who there's no way in the world I would let them judge anything. I wouldn't let them judge, you know, a cupcake contest. Nothing. I would not. They, they're not qualified. They're not. And and the problem is that there's no strenuous thing to become a judge. It's not. It's not as hard as people might actually think it is to become a judge. Yeah, you know, here's here's a question for you. You know, you had a guy in Austin Trout who. In most people's eyes, actually, um, through this guy, Fight Score Card Collector, uh, the fans actually had Austin Trout winning the fight. There were more fans that thought Austin won it than Canelo. But then, you know, given the WBC open scoring system, you get through eight rounds, and Austin finds out he's down 80 to 71 on one of the cards. What does that do to a fighter knowing that they can't even win a round on somebody's scorecard and then knowing that it's in that that they're in that position after all their work? Isn't that just incredibly disheartening and ruining it for him? Oh, sure. I mean, like he's he, he I mean, he, there's no reason but like, he could just say to himself, I give up. I give up. Why why try, why why get blasted here? I'm going to make the same money. I'm going to lose anyway. You've already got me losing. And then he starts thinking, you know, politics are against me and maybe it's because my manager and maybe my manager is not in with these people and maybe these people hate him and uh so yeah i think the um you know and it takes the it's like the amateurs uh you know what they what they do in the amateurs in the national i don't know if they still do but they did a few years ago when i was i was working a corner in the nationals after the round they come around with a slip of paper and they tell you who's winning yeah. they tell you the score so Theoretically, like if I'm going in, if I have a fighter and he's going into the last round of an amateur fight, and he, and I know, I know already that he's win, he's winning, twenty one to seven. Now in amateur boxing, that is a huge, insurmountable uh, span. You cannot win. There's no way the guy's gonna get enough points to beat you in the last round. So literally, I can tell my guy, run, just run, just run <laughs> around, box. Don't let this guy touch you, and you win the fight. And he's going to do it. And it's going to be the worst round you ever saw. There's going to be absolutely no drama whatsoever. And, uh, you know, so you ruin the ebb and the flow and the, the purity of the fight. There is no fight. Now it's just a technical, tactical 
let's make sure we just win without getting the guy getting lucky. You know, and and it's terrible. I mean, a fight is supposed to be. Uh, you don't know who's winning. That's the point. That's the that's the point of it. You're not supposed to know who's winning. You know, I want to. You know, that's the 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 excitement of and the new. You know, what I mean, and still, that's the excitement. That's that's one of the best parts of the fight. Remember when? I don't know how long you guys have been following boxing, but Chuck Hall back in the the Sugar Ray Leonard Hagler era. You know, he yep, was yep. the ring announcer, and For man, Vegas, when he. Yeah. It, right. Oh, and it was poetic, man. It was beautiful when he when it was a split decision, the Hagler Leonard fight. When that when he was about to read that last score, the world was on edge. Like the entire world was listening to Chuck Hall. You know, like everybody on earth was listening to see what Chuck Hall was about to say. And the uh, new and you know you're you're killing that with this new thing. And you know if they want to fix something. Fix the the fact that the, I mean, the WBC, it's nice. It's like, oh, wow, they're, they're trying to fix things. Take, take away at least 12 of the 47 championships that you have. No you know, kidding. Get rid of the silver and the yellow belt and the, <laughs> you know, I don't even, I mean, could you, do you know we live in an era where I cannot even tell you who the middleweight champion of the world is right now? I have no idea. And I know Martinez is in there somewhere, but I don't know if he is or he isn't. I don't know, I don't know if a silver means he's champion or it's 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 insane. I I literally despise. I cannot despise it any more than I do. It's not even possible. It's, it's just it's crazy. Nobody knows who the champions are, and at this point, I don't think people care. Like if they want to see Martinez fight, and that's it. They don't. I don't even know if he's champion. I guess he is, but. <laughs> He yeah, actually he is the. He actually that's one of the few belts that you can trace direct lineage to. That's um, Hopkins to Taylor, to Hopkins to Taylor to Pavlik to Martinez. He is actually the true middleweight champion. Okay, well here's the thing. I didn't know that till two seconds ago. I had no idea. <laughs> you know, and the thing is, but I don't care. I don't care that he's the champion because he is the champion. Like even if they said he wasn't the lineal champion, I go, well, he should be. I mean, he's the best right now. He's the guy we want to see him. Um, you know, and uh, so that's the thing. Like the lineal championship to me doesn't even mean anything because it's been chopped up. And you know, you go back to Ernie Terrell was a champion, and then you go back to when Spinks and Ali fought the rematch. So they, they, you know, like it's crazy because he ended up being a great champion. But the only reason Holmes even got to be the champion was because Ali and Spinks fought their rematch, and the WBC didn't like it. I mean, it's just uh, it's mind boggling how how stupid it is. Um, you know, I think in this era, um, you know, like right now, people, as far as I'm concerned, Hopkins is the champ. I mean, I just feel like he's the champ, whether he's lineal or not. I just feel like Hopkins is the man. And, uh, you know, at, at Super Middleweight, it's Andre Ward. You know, it's, it's, it's like it sucks for the other champions because they're going around going, yeah, hey, I'm, I'm the Super Middleweight champion of the world. And and I'm going, well, no, you're not. Like, Andre Ward's the Super Middleweight champion. Like, there can only be one champion. I don't care what anybody says. You know, it, it doesn't. It, it's not possible to have two champions of the world. Like you're, you're either the champion or you're not. I'm yeah. the is the champion. I don't care what the other people say. You know, well, so with these, um, with all these uh, injuries though to Martinez and uh, you know with the knee and stuff. I mean, he's going to be probably inactive for another year. Do you think uh, Golovkin can beat enough middleweights that you'd think you'd say, you know, I think this guy's the champion now? Um, I right, well, I mean, if a guy's inactive and you know, it's almost like when you're inactive. You know, as far as I'm concerned, like you're you're in retirement, and we're just waiting for you to come back. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Golovkin. I mean, it's actually good. Golovkin is making the noise he is because now we have the potential for a, a, a super fight at that weight. Um, but uh, like I said, I mean, just he's he's made noise recently, and I I was actually at his last fight, and I was really impressed. This guy's a little monster. He's a little devil you know and i mean he's all over these guys and he's just p- punching so hard and and you know he's good but uh you know it's hard to discount everything that martinez has already done and uh and that that, that just goes back to uh you know what i'm saying it's like there's too many champions i mean it's gotten to the point where it's ridiculous and there's like there's guys right now and then like i say nobody on planet earth respects fighters more than i do but when i see some guy at a fight and he's carrying, like, three belts with him. He's in the audience. You know, he's, he's a champion. He's brought the belts with him, and it's like, man, I'm a three-time champion. And you look, you know, it's like the IBO. He's got an IBO belt. He's got a, <laughs> a WBA belt that he that the only reason he won was because the champion was in recess because he had a broken toenail or something. You know, it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just insane. Like, 
the champions, you know, like like Adrian Broner, bring it back to Broner. You know, people are, like, I've had people telling me, like, oh, what are you talking about? He's three-time champion at 22. And I'm like, are you, are you insane? Like, <laughs> do you think his three-time championships match up to Wolfred Benitez's three-time championships at the same age? I mean, give me a break. I mean, come on, man. This is ridiculous. I mean, there's a reason why in the first hundred years of boxing, there was only, like, five guys or three guys or whatever it was, Henry Armstrong, uh, there was only a, couple, a handful of guys that won three titles. That was the thing. And, 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 and Armstrong had the four. And Arguello went for the fourth against Pryor. And he picked the baddest guy on earth to do it against, by the way. Um, you know, and he goes for the fourth, and it was a big deal. Now, do you realize there's guys that have four championships, and I wouldn't, if they walked up to me at the street and asked me for directions, I wouldn't even know who they are. And they're the <laughs> four-time champion of the world. I mean, this era... Like, when people brag about being a four-time champion, I go, listen, your four doesn't match up to Arguello's three. It does not. I don't care what you say. I don't care what the sanctioning body tells me. It's diluted. It's just, it's terrible. And, um, you know, it's hard to aspire to be the champion when you see how these guys become the champion some, in some cases. You know, when, when a guy moves up and weight, you know, Aguero moved up and he went for Pryor. I mean, this guy's on his fourth weight class. That takes and he balls. went for Aaron Pryor. You know what I mean? He went for Aaron Pryor. He didn't go for one or the other guy. He went for Aaron Pryor. I mean, come on. These guys go and, and they, they win four titles or three titles. And they never, ever beat the best guy. It'd be like, you, you know, with no, no disrespect to the other guys. But it's like if you go to super middleweight, from middleweight, like if Martinez or, or, or Golovkin move up, if they don't go for Andre Ward, then I don't care if they win the super middleweight title. you got to fight Andre Ward if you want to be the man in super middleweight. That's it. Everybody knows that. And yeah. so I respect Arguello for going after Breyer. I mean, that, that was that was unbelievable. That was awesome what he did. Uh, but now you can navigate. You know, you get a guy like Al Heyman, he can navigate these guys, and you go, hey, congratulations, we got another three times you have. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> like, I never heard of the guy he beat for the title. I never heard of the guy. I never saw it. I wouldn't know him if he, if he kicked me in the leg right now. So it's, uh, you know, the era we live in, I don't get, I'm not one to get excited about the three and four time champions. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't care. Do you I think that, I'm, I'm a purist. Do you think that the favoritism that Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. has been given through the WBC and HBO has been absolutely sickening and has been a plague on the sport? <laughs> Well, Maddie, tell yeah, them that's, your thoughts on the matter. <laughs> tell them how you really feel. You know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, you know what? I'll say this much. I will, you know, I'll give credit. I think, I think he's he's a little better than a lot of people want to give him credit. You know, they act like, oh, he sucks. He's terrible. I mean, he's you know, he's he's all right. He's learned on the job. He's pretty good. But yeah, the favoritism is very obvious. I mean, you know, his father, you know, Suleiman, this freaking guy. I mean, I remember. When he was ranked number one at, uh, I guess it was 140, right? Uh, Chavez, the father. And he loses to Willie Wise. So it's like, oh, man, it's over for him. And I think it was his next fight. He fights Kasha Zhu for the 140 title, and he's ranked number one. And I'm like, everybody's like, well, what do you mean he's ranked number one? He just lost to Willie Wise. And they said, oh, well, technically that fight was at 147, so it didn't count. I mean, <laughs> come on. Come on, man! Are you you know now you're just insulting the intelligence of all the eighth graders in the world. I mean, everybody <laughs> knows. I mean that uh, that he shouldn't still be ranked number one. I don't care what the weight was. Um, so it's you know yeah the favoritism is obviously there. I mean that's no you know and it's now and I think these guys Don King and 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 uh, Suleiman. I think these guys now they're just like screw it. We're not even going to hide it anymore. We're just going to be really blatant. <laughs> We're going to just blatantly show the favoritism as opposed to trying to hide it and manipulate it. And, you know, it's, it's gotten, it's just, that's the, the way the world is now. Like now, people just do stuff out in the open. They don't even, you know, they know the cell phone cameras are there and they're still doing it in the open. They don't, they don't, you know, they, they'd rather be on TV for running somebody over in their car than not being known at all. <laughs> so do you, do you think that basically at this point in time, considering that, you know, between Golden Boy and Top Rank and, you know, not being able to make fights, the sanctioning bodies, poor judging, etc., that is ultimately just up to the fans to really determine who the man in each division is and, and who the fighters that are really top-tier fighters are, no matter what's being oh, yeah. shoved down our throats? Oh, yeah, no, that's, that's, no, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like, to me, 
Martinez is the champion. Andre Ward is the champion. Hopkins is the champion. I mean, that, that's how I feel. That, that, that's what the champion is. I don't care what the other groups say. It's up to the fans to know what they're looking at. I mean, you can't, you know, strip a guy because you don't like his promoter, ultimately. And then you have this other guy who we never even heard of fight another guy that we never even heard of from two countries that we didn't even know existed. And then call them the champion. And then everyone's supposed to go, yeah, you know, these guys, are, that's the middleweight champ right there. I say, no, he's not. You know, no, he's not. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible, politically, it's just a terrible era. It really, it really, I hate to say it. I mean, I hate to, I, mean, I don't want to be one of these guys like, that says he loves boxing, but then he's trying to tear it down. But, man, the expression, it is what it is, is so, you know, prevalent here. I mean, it is what it is. It just, I can't, I'm not the guy to sit there and, and uh, you know, well, I'll give you an example. So, let's see if you can relate to this. Now, like Demetrius Andrade, who I know, he's a, very, he's a very talented kid. I've sparred with him. I've seen him since he was a young kid. You know, he's, he's a good fighter. He's a very good fighter. He's talented. But, He's fighting for the WBO title, and something happened, and now he's fighting somebody else. I don't even know if the fight's still He's on. fighting uh, Vanna Smart Erosion. Okay. Now, what he said, yeah. I read a thing where he said, you know, I'm about to make history. Watch watch me make history. And I'm just saying, come on, man. Like, like, what do you mean? Like, if you win the WBO title, you're going to be making history? I mean, I mean, that's like saying if I go over there and, you know, eat that cupcake, I'm going to make <laughs> history. I mean, come on, what do you mean? Like... Dude, you know, Roberto Duran going from lightweight to junior middleweight, you know, after he was considered shot, you know, and then he wins his third title over Davey Moore. I mean, that was some kind of history, you know, and, and Arguello going after Pryor was, he could have said, hey, tune in and watch me make history. But, you know, winning the WBO junior middleweight title, you know, in the same weight class that, that you have Canelo and Mayweather and these guys, um, you know, they're, they're in that area. I mean, well, I mean, I just don't see what history we're talking about here. That, uh, John, that's Peter, what I, I think, think, think he may have been referring what? to, you know, if Providence, Rhode Island has ever had a world champion. Maybe that was the history he was referring to. <laughs> ah, hey, Vinny Paz was world champ, IBF and WBA. That's right. Yeah, what am I talking about? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. No, it. it's, no, it's just, no, he doesn't even know what he's saying. Like, everybody says that. Like, I'm about to make history. You know, like, that's just the, like, I don't think they understand what history actually means. Making history actually means. They think, you know, they, they, they put themselves on a pedestal before their time, and, and it's not their fault. I mean, the, the sanctioning bodies have, have done this, and TV has done this. They've made these guys believe that they're on par with the greats of history. They've diluted it so much. They've made it so accessible that it's just uh, just bizarre. And, uh, and and like I say, I'm not coming down on anybody, but uh, man, I just I'm just I'm hating on the game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what and, I mean? yeah, you and you have to respect history. I mean, history to me, in, in you know my uh, in the last 15 years of boxing, is Roy Jones Jr. winning a portion of the heavyweight championship and Bernard Hopkins continuing to win titles at his advanced age. To me. That that's the history that's been made, and really nothing more than that. Right, right, and and listen, Hopkins is not looking to win over, uh, you know, certain guy. Like he fought Chad, and it didn't work out, so he went to Tavares Cloud, who everyone said, "Oh man, that Tavares is a is a monster. He's vicious. He's a big puncher." And Hopkins is like, "All right, well, let's let's see what happens." I mean, I, I mean, you have to respect that. Um, you know, it's just, uh, like I say, these fighters are a product of the world they live in. So I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily against the fighters. I just think they don't have the education and the knowledge of history to understand how, the, what they're saying, how foolish it sounds. You know what I mean? Like, like I say, Adrian Broner, three-time champion. I mean, come on, man. I mean, come on. I yeah, mean, I mean, this you, is you, just, it's ridiculous. If you throw out Marquez's um, interim title at 140 pounds, he's basically saying that he's on the same level as Juan Manuel Marquez, and they should never be discussed in the same breath. Right, right. It's just, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a terrible era. And, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, you get, you get the, the people now, and, uh, you know, you get a Grammy winner. Uh, you know, some girl, you know, she she sold a whole bunch of albums because she's, you know, it's not necessarily her voice as much as just her, her whole show and her, her persona and all that stuff. And it's like, man, like, 
you know, me and Celine Dion <laughs> were <laughs> Grammy winners. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. It's just like, uh, you know, it's like, man, me, Whitney Houston, and Celine Dion were the, were the best. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. You know? And uh, so, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're in an era. I mean, it, it, you know, it's up to the fans to decide who the, who the, what the reality is. And, uh, and I remember, you know, you know who did it good? I remember Glenn Johnson and Tarver. They wanted to fight. They wanted to unify. You know, they had both beaten Roy. And, um, and the TV, no, the sanction body, WBC, whichever one it was, they wouldn't sanction it because they were different sanctioned bodies. And, you know, they, had, they wanted them to fight the mandatory, some guy, you know, who I don't even remember who it was. And I remember Glenn Johnson and Tarver were like, well, screw the title then. We'll just fight each other and see yep. who the best is. And that was the, one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Like, I, I, was, I was so excited when they did that. Um, you know, they just told the sanction about it. It's like, are you, you know, are you insane? Like, are you crazy? Or we have to fight each other. I don't care what you say. You know, it's just like Hopkins. I guess he gave up the title because they wanted him to fight this guy. No disrespect to the guy, but I, I don't know the guy, and I, I'm not sure how he became the mandatory, but, um, you know, they wanted him to fight this guy. You know, and, and it's just, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a tangled web, I'll say that. But listen, I need to tell you guys one thing. Remember how earlier I said I moved to Florida because my wife said we were? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, well, my wife is waiting for me in, in oh, Home Depot. I, I remember. And, <laughs> and I know, I, and I know my wife, and I know she's in there, and I know she's gritting her teeth, and she understands that I have to do the interview, but uh, I think I better get in there. No, John, and we really, really appreciate <laughs> your time. Um, and every, everyone, uh, if you get a chance, what do you have an idea what gym you're going to be working for there in Florida? Uh, to be honest, I'm in I'm in Orlando, so I'm looking at um uh you know a Coley Orlando um I guess it's Winter Haven or Winter Park right that general area um I'm not I'm not 100 sure to be honest with you I'm not 100 percent sure uh but it'll be soon I'm actually going around checking out things uh, this week so um so I'll know pretty soon and I'm definitely going to be uh getting myself in the mix here well well all all you fighters down the florida area that check out our podcast if you're looking for a top-notch trainer uh travel up there check out john scully and john we really appreciate your time and uh we wish you the best and uh, hopefully we can talk to you again sometime i appreciate it it was, uh, it was a lot of fun actually and uh yeah call me call me whenever you need somebody to talk i'm, I'm always here cool <laughs> sounds good john you uh I, I hope we didn't get you in too much trouble with the wife there <laughs> No, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to take her out to dinner later. I'll be good. All right, man. Will you take care of yourself? Thanks again. <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. All right, buddy. Thank you. All right, guys. Okay.